Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so today we are going to be discussing nature based solutions in FEMA region two. Uh, can can anyone confirm they can hear me? Yes. Yes, can hear you. All right, great. Thanks. Um, so thank you so much for attending sure. this presentation sure. today. Make sure everyone that you um, mute yourselves because I heard a little bit of echo. Um, so this presentation today on Region 2 Nature Based Solution Initiative and Implementation Strategies. My name is Sarah Lapuma and I represent the Resilience Branch in the Mitigation Division, as well as the Climate Adaptation Initiative Committee. I'm so glad to see so many of my colleagues want to learn about nature based solutions, one of many tools in FEMA's climate resilience toolbox. I want to remind you all to make sure your microphone is on mute until the question and answer time period at the end of the meeting. And we will be recording this presentation so you can rewatch it or share it with colleagues after we get the recording link to you all. I'll briefly describe the bios of our speakers first, then we'll start with Ela Cruz Nasario. Our first speaker will be Ela Cruz Nasario, Field Coordinator for Community Assistance and the Interagency Recovery Coordination Branch Chief and Acting FDRO in the Hazard Mitigation Division for Hurricane Maria, DR 4339 in Puerto Rico. Ela has a bachelor's degree in biology with a major in zoology and a master's degree in environmental planning. Before working in FEMA, she worked in various government agencies such as the Solid Waste Management Authority. She served as executive director for several NGOs, focusing their work on environmental conservation and resiliency. Since 2018 to the present, she works in the Community Assistance Recovery Support Function and recently also serves as the Interagency Recovery Coordination Branch Chief in the DR 4339 Hazard Mitigation Division. Her team leads the coordination of the PRJRO Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Strategy. Our se second speaker will be Jennifer DiLorenzo. Jennifer is the Public Assistance Branch Chief in the Recovery Division of FEMA Region 2. Jennifer began her work with FEMA post-Hurricane Sandy as a local hire in February 2013, working on coastal resiliency projects and long-term community recovery plans for the Federal Disaster Recovery Coordination. With her environmental background, she moved to Region 2's EHP, working as lead environmental protection specialist. Combining her community work and environmental expertise, she moved to public assistance as section chief and later as Ac acting deputy branch chief for DR4086 New Jersey. Jennifer is now public assistance branch chief for the regional operations branch in Region 2. Her teaching skills for FEMA enabled her that many Region 2 staff to become certified floodplain managers and DSA qualified. Jennifer also serves on the President's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. Prior to FEMA, Jennifer worked for several engineering firms on coastal restoration projects and taught science classes at Monmouth University and Stevens Institute of Technology. She holds a master's in degree in marine environmental science at, from SUNY at Stony Brook and is a certified floodplain manager. With that, um, I will ask Ayla to begin sharing her screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Uh, can you confirm if you can see the full screen? Yes, and it is. For your presentation? Oh, yes. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sara and, and Luis uh, from the initiative and, and for the invitation to share what we have been doing in the Puerto Rico GRO as part of the Climate Adaptation Initiative, uh, specifically for things related to uh, natural nature-based solutions. Uh, first, and, and I'm going through the, the agenda. Uh, well, I'm not alone in this presentation. I also have colleagues from the Community Assistance and the Interagency Recovery Coordination Division on the line, specifically Frances Santiago, who is also a planner and will be joining and, and supporting with any questions uh, or technical information that is needed as part of the presentation. So thank you for them to, to join and, and support in this uh, sharing experience. Well, before going to the agenda, I, I know, uh, well, we know that FEMA can fund 
nature-based solutions, and, and also we know that nature-based solutions sometimes is the best way to approach a hazard or, or to incorporate strategies as part of, of recovery funds. But we also know that we are not always aware or ready to start addressing or incorporating nature-based solutions in the projects that we are reviewing. And to the lack of, of a couple of things, it could be technical capacity, time, staff, or, or any other things that I'm going to be addressing during the presentation. So that's why today I will be showing the steps or the actions, or it could be like the methodology that we use to start implementing, uh, that we started implementing in the Puerto Rico GRO to make nature-based solutions part of the conversation and part of the projects that are being reviewed by our colleagues in the different programs, but also that uh, to, for nature-based solutions to be considered as part of the climate adaptation strategies for local governments, uh, NGOs, and community organizations. So um, to start, I'm going to be sharing what we have been doing in terms of the capacity building initiatives, uh, how we developed the Puerto Rico Climate Change Mitigation Adaptation Document, which is like the time, uh, time frame for the rest of the activities that we do, timeline of actions, uh, mitigation project trackers, repetitive tools, NBS projects examples, and we are going to be closing with some needs that we have identified, lesson learned, and, and next steps. And also at the end, we will have time to start uh, to, to clarify or to share additional information that the participants uh, need. Well, who are we? I know that most of you are familiar with what the Interagency Recovery Coordination and the Community Assistance uh, Recovery Support Branch are, but we wanted uh, to let you know why are we doing this and, and why are we are part of this uh, coordination effort. Uh, part of our mission or our role is to support uh, local governments and NGOs in their long-term recovery process, providing planning technical support through a whole community approach. And how we do that is that we leverage or we coordinate the expertise from the different federal uh, agencies, but also with local partners such as uh, the academia, NGOs, and subject matter experts that are always available to support in that capacity building process for our staff, but also for the, the local governments. Uh, we help them to build their capabilities to effectively plan and manage for recovery or, or a simple way to say it's to help them make good decisions as part of the projects that they are doing uh, through their Maria recovery process. And also uh, through all the years that we have been uh, developing relationships with the local governments, we have been able to learn uh, to learn from them the gaps, uh, the gaps in terms of technical uh, support, resources, staff, and also supporting them in the development of strategies. Uh, I, I'm going to be sharing some examples uh, to them uh, in the slides. Well, I mentioned uh, that we do this uh, like our uh, framework, it could be uh, said, or it's like a, the foundation document for the different activities that we are doing, and that's the Puerto Rico GRO, GRO Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Strategy document. Uh, well, this is a document that we started working on in the 2021 and throughout uh, all this uh, time. Uh, that document was developed uh, incorporating uh, actions and recommendations from the different divisions. Uh, we, uh, our leadership identified POCs uh, by the different programs. The document was approved at the GRO level and then was shared for, uh, for regions approval. And that all happened on uh, at the beginning of 2022. Uh, we had briefing sessions and working sessions with the POCs of the different programs. And we developed a tracker. I'm going to share some insights of that tracker in the, in the next slides. And, Right now, we are in the process of updating that document because that's a living document to include additional activities identified by the programs. I think that the, the most important thing that I should mention about this document is that this is an implementable document. This is not a, 
something that we did to say, well, we have a, a strategy that addresses climate adaptation and, and includes all these good uh, things. But this is something that needs to be implemented. You know I mean? And and that's why we have, I, have uh, that, I think that I someone is on mute. <laughs> And, and that's why we included specific activities uh, throughout the five goals that uh, that I'm going to share uh, in the next slides. Well, why we did this? Well, first, as you all know, sí, there sí, there yeah, are yeah, presidential. Yeah, 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 I'm going to press uh -huh. uh, mute all and then unmute yourself after that. Sí, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, did that work? Yeah, I okay, but I cool. think I, I need to. OK, perfect. Oh. Good, OK. Well, uh, we did this uh, first to comply with the presidential executive orders and uh, uh, that mandated all uh, federal agencies to start addressing climate change, but also to the goals that are included in our FEMA strategic plan, which includes one of the goals that is related to climate change and the other one that is related to equity, and, and they are both uh, connected. Uh, we wanted to formalize strategies that were already in course. Some of the things that I'm going to show you here are things that started happening before the document was created, but we identified the lack uh, of coordination or communication between us in the different programs something that could be addressed uh, by having some a formal document that incorporated what everyone was doing. Uh, so we use this document also as an instrument for for coordination or, or cross cutting am among the programs, uh, engaging them uh, as part of the, the initiative, identifying activities that are for their own programs. Uh, not all that is related with, well, let me go back. It, the intent was for everyone to understand that we are all responsible of achieving the goal uh, to address climate mitigation and adaptation. And, and that's why we wanted to include everyone in this document uh, to develop new strategies and actions, and most of all, to monitor the development of activities. And you will see how, how the different programs through their own capabilities are addressing activities to to mitigate and and to adapt to climate change. Excuse well, the document me, includes. Uh, five... uh, yes, uh, I apologize. Um, before you were interrupted a, a while ago, I, I believe you're also going to uh, share a, a tracker with us. Yes, I, I'm going to share it in oh, the oh. next slides. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Yeah, so the document have five goals and this is like a general document. If someone hasn't seen the document and wishes to receive a copy, just uh, put it in the chat and uh, we will make sure to, to share the, the document with, uh, with all of you. Um, one of the goal is to increase climate change awareness and how we are doing that. As I said, this needs to be implementable. So the document includes specific activities and we are working about, uh, through capacity building to foster equity and opportunity for growth, also to develop workshops uh, such as the Water Summit that was done, a series of workshops that we are doing with other agencies. Uh, also, we are doing some job aids, and I'm going to discuss what the job aids are in the at, at the end of the presentation, trainings, among others. The second goal, which is uh, to leverage actionable data and tools to address current and future risk. We are supporting the decision-making process with studies, but and how we are doing that, we are reaching out to SMEs and we are sharing that information with our partners. We are also sharing information about publications uh, with the best science and, and their most recent data to local uh, stakeholders or to municipalities as well as FEMA colleagues. The third one is to make investments that are climate resilience um, and how we are doing that. Well, we are promoting the, the uh, to include uh, communities and in a whole community approach as part of the funding process. Building an infrastructure are resilient to climate change. It, I, I always like to use an example, a specific example on how this goal is being implemented. And it's something as simple as uh, hazard mitigation started to include 
in the letters to subapplicants a uh, wording and uh, just one sentence that says uh, that NBS can be part of the projects funded by FEMA. And it, it may seem simple, uh, but it's not because it's an acknowledgement that uh, nature-based solutions is something that it's possible. And, and sometimes it's the first time the municipality sees that and start asking, what is that? How can I do to include that as part of my projects? Goal number four, achieve operational sustainability and resilience. This is the goal that we are, as our interaction in the office, uh, can, can, can have an impact through recycling, uh, the use of more resilient equipment and materials. And goal number five, the integrate perspective of historically underserved communities into the climate adaptation actions. This may seem like a super big goal and, and something uh, not that clear, but I'm going to give you a, a, a specific example of how we are achieving that. Uh, the community assistance team developed a, a training that it's called recovery visualization tools training. And that's no other thing that a mapping training uh, for them to learn how to identify in a maps using a free web-based app. Uh, so they don't have to have a, specialized staff or special equipment or funds to, to, to acquire an application. And we teach them how to, how to identify hazard, risk, and opportunities in their own community. And this is helping them uh, get uh, knowledge and control of their planning process, incorporating what climate adaptation is or, or the different climate hazards. Uh, and for most of them, this is the first time they see their community in a map that includes the different uh, risks. So, so they can start looking at it as an opportunity to, to plan, to take control of their uh, future and start identifying how they see themselves in the future. I, what I mentioned about the tracker, well, this is an example. Or this is not the tracker because the tracker is an Excel spread, spreadsheet and it would be like a uh, not easy to show in, in a slide, but uh, in, in a biweekly basis, uh, every program enters updates on that trackers. And the tracker is uh, divided by the five goals that I just mentioned and the activities that each program is identifying. And as you can see here, we have PA, hazard mitigation, EHP, hazard mitigation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, community assistance, RSF, and a uh, mission support and everyone is playing a role uh, in in this process and everyone is playing a role to comply with that with what's included in the in the tracker in the strategy i'm sorry additional examples and and as i say we can and what i'm sharing sharing is how we did it how we how we managed to to start including NBS as part of the, the recovery projects uh, that the Puerto Rico Maria team is, is uh, reviewing. Uh, capacity building. Uh, one of the biggest gaps that we find in local uh, municipalities is the lack of knowledge on the different resources available, on the, on the different techniques available for them to recover. And also there's a need for more knowledge in, internally in FEMA. We have a, a super capable uh, workforce, but we don't have to know everything and, and we learn every day. So for that reason, we identify uh, things that are uh, common or constant throughout the different projects. And we design a training, a, a webinar or an in-person workshop to target that specific need not only with the science and the theory, but also with implementable tools for them to get the information. And as we say in Spanish, con que se come eso, how, how, what do I do with that information? And, and, and we try to cover that through in that uh, workshop. Some examples are rock paints, and you are going to be a super cool uh, example of something that the hazard mitigation uh, team uh, developed. Rock Banks is an NBS and it's been included for the first time as part of the projects that the Puerto Rico Yarrow Road team is including. Techniques for cleaning water bodies, uh, coastal erosions, el, uh, 
sedimentation, uh, community driven relocation, among others. So through this, we started uh, to to promote the governments to implement nature-based solutions. Now we go to the meetings and they ask for, for this and they tell us, I want to change uh, this scope of work or I want to start addressing the problem of flooding in my urban center through a different strategies. What can I do? And also we are including NBS through our technical assistance or to our targeted technical assistance. We have different projects. One of them is the regional recovery approach. And that's, a, as the name says, a regional approach as part of the planning and, and recovery process with municipalities of the different Puerto Rico emergency management uh, zones. Uh, and, and the main role, main reason, uh, goal of this project is for them to start knowing that they have similarities and that they have issues that need to be addressed uh, without thinking about the, the boundaries of the municipalities. For example, coastal erosion is not limited to a, a single municipality. Coastal erosion needs to be addressed in a more whole community approach. Uh, example, it's the municipality of Utuado. We are uh, super proud of this one. Uh, this started several years ago with a solutions team that existed, which was the flood control and drainage solutions team. A group of uh, different partners uh, the, from Department of Interior, NOAA, USES, EPA, and local staff, they drafted a document that addressed a uh, sedimentation in a, um, in rivers in the urban area in, in Utuado that at the end were uh, causing uh, sedimentation problems in the Dos Bocas Reservoir, which is the main potable water resource for the metropolitan area here in Puerto Rico. And they, had, and they did that through a watershed management approach. That project is still uh, in the in the making and the municipality continue to use the information in that document as part of their funding uh, process not only for fema because right now the municipality is asking for the puerto rico housing department for funds to implement several of the steps on on these projects um, in terms of the uh, one of the trackers that i mentioned at the beginning uh, Hazard mitigation team developed a uh, climate change NBS and equity mitigation uh, tracker. And that uh, what here is the result of the most recent data for the photo four projects. Uh, three NBS projects approved, 21 approved projects for climate resiliency, and 93 approved projects that address equity. I'm going to go more in, in the in the tracker in this slide. Uh, the, the purpose was, well, of course, to monitor and, and track what it's been doing, uh, what it's currently under review for MBS, climate change and equity, but also to start promoting the staff to think about MBS. For example, if I'm a project officer and I need to review a project, I, I can start thinking about, well, does that project include MBS? What can I do to include MBS in that project? Is it possible to include MBS? And that's why the team that developed this tracker, they created a database that includes the concepts of the climate change. Uh, they develop a presentation to all the staff, and then that team uh, reviewed the projects to identify uh, which of them included NBS, climate change, and equity. And here you see an example of the San Juan Metro Coral uh, Reef and how it includes uh, nature-based solutions, climate change, and how it how it includes uh, climate change among others. This tracker is included in the SharePoint, and we the, we will have we are currently working on the revamp of the climate tracker, reviewing again the definitions and, and modifying uh, the process. This is a snapshot, an example of what you can get if you do the analysis for the 406 projects and how you can identify what, uh, what amount of projects, this is as March 21st, uh, include NBS. Uh, this is a, a super cool tool. Uh, it was developed a, a, in hazard mitigation also, and it's called the hazard mitigation repetitive. And it's an example spreadsheet uh, that uh, address uh, 
repetitive damages. As you can see here in the roads, we had a, a lot of uh, issues in the in roads and, and in water bodies. And they include the cost for a pro comprehensive mitigation solution, a suggested scope of work, notes, images, and details. And why is this important? As I said at the beginning, we are lacking technical capacity and most of all, we are lacking time. For that reason, we want to make it easier for the subapplicant to consider the incorporation of NBS as part of their projects. One example is the Green Gavions, uh, and they are super popular right now. They are doing uh, and, and they are asking to include them. Rock veins was another uh, of the repetitives that was uh, prepared and, and that it's available and uh, permeant uh, pavement. Two examples that I want to uh, share quickly. I know that there will, have, there will be a future presentation that uh, will address uh, this project more in depth, but the San Juan Metro Coral Reef Barrier, it was a project that was awarded through Maria, the subapplicant was the Puerto Rico Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. And the main goal of this is to attenuate coastal flooding by increasing the coral reef, a three-dimensional structure, and it it's a combination of artificial coral-like hybrid cement structure and native uh, live uh, coral around along five kilometers of the coastal of San Juan. I want to highlight with this project that this was the first time that coral reefs were identified as a critical uh, structure. And I think that's super important that it's happening and that we are sharing that message with the local uh, stakeholders. An additional project, uh, it's in the BKS Aquifer Storage Recovery. This project's main goal is to remove an invasive plant species, also to establish a native riparian buffer zone and uh, con con constructing sand dams and implementing a model of agroecological farming system. Uh, I think it's important to highlight in this project that it's an, a great example of how we are incorporating or addressing equity as part of the projects and, and most of all because it, it plans to solve or to attenuate uh, a, a drug issue uh, that it's in, in Vieques Island. Needs identified, uh, we need to promote more policy changes to incentivize uh, NBS implementation. For example, cost share match for projects that include NBS. Uh, identify benefit or BCA opportunities to promote climate adaptation measures, development of case studies with, with natural based solutions, implemented projects, lesson learned, support planning process in local, <laughs> sorry, the timer, communities to incorporate climate adaptation, it's needed. We need, uh, and that needs to be taken in consideration as part of the review of the hazard mitigation plans. For that, we can build more capacity, we can provide technical assistance, and we can promote or should promote a better collaboration between the different FEMA programs and the local agencies. Next steps, uh, we at, uh, by May uh, of this year, we will be publishing three job aids focused on, in, or on nature-based nature solutions activities, uh, specifically for the Puerto Rico topography. Uh, we know that FEMA has a lot of uh, MBS job aids, uh, but they, they can be, as I said at the beginning, we need to tell them what can you do with the information. So these job aids will include schematics uh, drawings, will include cost, will include examples or different areas in Puerto Rico, our rivers and our creeks and our coast uh, coastlines and how they can incorporate NBS to solve issues in that specific area. So that we are expecting to receive all of them by May, and we will have a workshop for the FEMA staff on June uh, of 2024. We are going to continue with our webinars and also to execute, uh, to perform tabletop mapping exercises for municipalities, which we believe it's the, the first step in identifying a, a recovery or planning strategy for them. And also something that we are doing uh, as part of the collaboration with the Mission Support Training Unit and NOAA, it's that we are developing the first uh, Climate Change uh, 101 
mandatory training that is going to be offered to the Puerto Rico GRO. And the content is currently being developed by the NOAA Climate Adaptation Program uh, staff. And with that, that's uh, all of the slides that I have for today. I'm available for questions. Thank you. We will hold. That was so really, it was really spectacular. We have a lot to learn from what the Puerto Rico GRO is doing. We will hold our questions until the Q&A period so that uh, both questions, you can write questions into the chat as well. Um, and so then I'll ask them out loud or everyone can come off mute and ask out loud. Uh, but we will go on next to Jennifer DiLorenzo's presentation. Good afternoon, I'm Jennifer DiLorenzo. I'm the Public Assistance Branch Chief for FEMA Region 2. And i um, happy to be here today to talk about nature-based solutions. I'm gonna give some examples from the field in New York and New Jersey. So nature-based solutions, uh, we're trying to use them in FEMA to support humans and their well-being and also to um, increase biodiversity. So some of the things we're looking at is uh, protection and restoration of natural ecosystems, uh, maintaining the sustainability of our aquatic ecosystems, and also looking at integrating um, nature in and around our cities and more developed areas. So the Department of Interior has a definition um, for nature-based solutions. It's an action that incorporates natural features and processes to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use and manage natural and or modified ecosystems to address socio-environmental challenges while providing measurable co-benefits to both people and nature. So that's um, a long definition, but we usually refer to nature-based solutions as green infrastructure or natural infrastructure. So nature-based solutions, um, as Ella talked about earlier, can address climate change. Um, we can use those um, solutions to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, capture and store carbon dioxide, and also use them to enhance ecosystems so that we can protect our coastal communities to adapt to um, climate change, like flooding and sea level rise, also to look at um, how to address more frequent and, and intense droughts and floods and heat waves and wildfires. So green versus gray infrastructure. So traditionally um, FEMA has funded on uh, the, uh, the harder structures for addressing seawalls, uh, for addressing flooding like seawalls and dikes to prevent flooding and storm surge and erosion. So we do a lot of those projects in coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers and other federal agencies. But we're looking to move towards uh, more natural solutions and at least incorporating some of those um, natural solutions along with the gray infrastructure. So in terms of nature-based solutions, we're looking at bioengineering um, where we've had traditional infrastructure like dikes and bulkheads and ditches and uh, that hard infrastructure, we're looking to use those nature-based solutions. And we're also looking at hybrid solutions where we have a hardened structure along a shoreline, but we're also incorporating natural plants and um, nature-based solutions behind them. So how are we suddenly able to do that? Um, looking, uh, We were looking towards the future and thinking about how we could get away from some of the uh, completely gray infrastructure that we've been using in the past. Well, in April of 2022, um, the executive order 140072 um, allowed uh, and directed the federal government to use natural solutions and let us incorporate nature-based solutions to improve our resilience um, and also help communities address climate change. So FEMA public assistance and our mitigation program can now consider nature-based solutions to help communities become more resilient, address climate change. And this especially works well with uh, combining our funding with other federal, state, and local and nonprofit funds. So what did we do? So FEMA put out um, uh, nature-based solutions series in 2021. 
We uh, developed a guide for local communities, and in 2023, we provided communities with uh, strategies for success. And these can be um, downloaded from our FEMA website, or maybe, um, Sarah, if you can drop them into the chat. But some of the um, key points for these documents um, to make nature-based solutions successful is including the entire community and building strong partnerships between state federal and local and nonprofit organizations, um, matching the project um, with our desired goals and nature-based benefits, um, maximizing benefits for both um, the community and nature, and designing for the future, thinking about climate change and uh, sea level rise in mind. So FEMA, um, as I said, finding that um, nature-based solutions work well with um, a combined planning efforts where we can uh, look at hazard mitigation and risk reduction, uh, climate resilience, watershed management, source water protection, and land use and economic development plans. So in our less uh, developed areas, land conservation and um, fire management strategies and levees uh, may work well combined with nature-based solutions. As we move to more developed areas, we're looking at um, things like rain gardens, rainwater harvesting, permeable pavement and green streets. And then moving towards the shore, um, we're looking at waterfront parks to enhance our enjoyment as well as our resiliency for um, coastal events. We're looking to encourage living shorelines and as uh, Ella talked about, the coral reef projects and protecting coastal wetlands. So where are we getting the funding? So um, HMA, the Hazard Mitigation Assistance, can provide funding for some of these nature-based projects. And on the mitigation side, they have uh, BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Funding, to incorporate these nature-based solutions. For public assistance, um, we use our funding to repair or replace um, community infrastructure, but we're also looking at our 406 mitigation, which goes along with public assistance and incorporating these nature-based solutions in those projects. So FEMA um, made this easier for us to accomplish by looking at ecosystem service values in our benefit cost analyses. This allows us to um, look at the value of these ecosystem services when we're um, doing a BCA. And in that, in those cases where we have a project that includes nature-based solutions, using this new formulation, we're able to provide that funding. We're also working with the Nature Conservancy. Um, they've been promoting nature-based hazard mitigation uh, through FEMA mitigation grants, and they provide um, assistance to communities and information on how to uh, go about incorporating the nature-based solutions um, De depending on the hazard and the location of the projects and what you want to protect and make maximizing um, the ecosystem benefits. So public-private partnerships there. In addition, our own EHP um, has developed a primer for nature-based hazard mitigation, um, giving information on how they're going to re review those projects and um, how they're going to um, incorporate um, their reviews to encourage nature-based solutions. In addition, uh, FEMA has also been partnering with our other federal agencies to provide training to community leaders um, and partners to get them started. So the NDPTC, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, has a nature-based solutions course. Um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has, also has a course for coastal managers to help them work on uh, nature-based solutions and projects to reduce their hazards from coastal storms. And the EPA has a watershed academy that uh, provides a course um, that provides um, information on co-benefits through hazard mitigation planning and water resource management. So those other federal agencies are working with us to provide training um, to FEMA staff as well as communities. And those courses are available um, to FEMA staff who would like to take them. We've also looked at um, community rating systems. So that's um, 
a way for communities to lower their flood insurance by reducing risk um, under the National Flood Insurance Program. So we recently changed the way we give our CRS credits uh, and in, uh, elevated the credits for nature-based solutions. So more credit is given for preserving open space, restoring wetlands, and or developing a living shoreline. The number of points that we award for preserving open space is now the highest in the program. And uh, we also give credits based on the percentage of preserved open space in the floodplain. The larger the percentage, the more credit that is awarded. So that's been very successful. Um, so here in New York and New Jersey, um, we've been trying uh, very hard to incorporate nature-based solutions. For example, uh, along the Long Island and Jersey shores, uh, FEMA will pay, uh, public assistance will pay for um, berm restoration. We coordinate this with Army Corps of Engineers beach replenishment projects. And then the communities can go in and uh, plant native uh, beach grass to stabilize the dune and the shoreline for future resilience. We also uh, look at buyouts. Um, so in uh, some communities like Woodbridge, Old, Bridge and Sayreville, New Jersey, FEMA funds were used to uh, coordinate with the buyout program that the state of New Jersey has, uh, de demolish the repetitive lost homes, and return the area back to natural conditions. And the key is that once these um, areas are bought out, um, the land remains as permanent open space through a deed restriction. So we have repetitive lost homes. Um, in many areas of uh, New Jersey, with uh, the New Jersey DEP, they identify those homes at risk um, and how many have how many times they've been flooded. Uh, they'll put up Blue Acres funds to buy out the homeowners. Um, FEMA will pay for the demolition and the uh, and the uh, disposal of the debris from that demolition. And then the state, um, in conjunction with Rutgers University, has been planting native plants to restore those areas back to natural conditions. Some other examples where we've used more of a hybrid technique um, in uh, Middlesex County, and uh, they have pump stations in Sayreville and Edison, and also in Bay Park in uh, East Rockaway, New York. Um, FEMA funds were used to conduct uh, construct flood walls around their facilities. These are the hard structures. And the reason we're doing that is to prevent any discharges during um, storms and protect the shellfish growing waters and the water quality of the surrounding uh, natural environment during storm events. In addition, we're looking uh, and working with them to coordinate their funding so that they preserve the open space and restore some vegetation along the shoreline so that there's even more protection. In Seabright and Monmouth Beach, um, there was a seawall uh, uh, that uh, had some gaps in it from uh, when it was built in the 60s, I believe. And those uh, gaps allowed seawater during Hurricane Sandy to come in and flood the communities. So FEMA PA, in coordination with the NJDEP, our funds were used to fill in the gaps in the existing seawall protecting the community. And at the same time, um, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and replenished the sand on the beach. And the community then came in and planted natural beach grass to keep that sand in place. So it's a, a hybrid solution, hard structure with a um, nature-based solution. So uh, in terms of PA 406 mitigation funding, I already mentioned the benefit cost analysis that we want to use to um, encourage those solutions. Um, we're working in PA with um, uh, Southern New Jersey on the Heislerville Dyke, where we're gonna be restoring the dike and uh, we're repairing that uh, the condition to protect the community. But we're also doing uh, wetlands reconstruction um, where we would be able to see a benefit of uh, 40 million for uh, 1 million in repairs. So that's a, a, a big benefit for the communities down there. 
So the best ways to do this, uh, we've looked at land conservation and restoration. So FEMA will pay for stabilization of a shoreline. And then uh, groups like the Nature Conservancy or the American Literal Society will come in and with their funding and start to uh, replenish with native plants and trees. Uh, we've also looked at um, more as eco-friendly options in terms of uh, living shorelines, using oyster reefs. Uh, we worked with our communities. And they do a project to incorporate rain gardens, permeable payments, and incorporating green streets. So here's an example of uh, oysters along the shoreline, more natural uh, way to protect from erosion. And again, along our beaches, we see a lot of erosion. Um, and it, again, with um, some of the communities like the uh, Nature Conservancy and American Literal Society, we've put in hardened structures, but we've also allowed for planting and the, uh, the environment is, is better served and the protection is increased. So I mentioned brick under the mitigation division. Um, so they have some examples um, in New Jersey where they're using their funds for uh, Jersey City has McGovern Park where they will be um, creating a large capacity of storage of underground um, underground storage to control surface flooding. Um, and then along with that, they'll have some park amenities and permeable pavers and green space. And then one project that's been done, um, Hoboken Southwest Resiliency Park is already in place, but FEMA is going to use brick funding to expand that park um, to allow for green infrastructure and mitigate um, flooding. Some examples in New York. Um, so for NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority, they've been uh, looking at stormwater protection for some of their, um, their housing units. So they've we've been able to provide some brick funding for um, uh, gardens and plantings to reduce um, uh, increased stormwater infiltration and then reduce extreme heat around the buildings. And then we've also used that hard structure for backup power. And with the New York City DEP, uh, we've been working on cloudburst hubs, um, Casena, Carter and Corona East. These are areas where um, these cloudburst hubs are gonna act as a buffer for storms. Um, any water that's not captured by the sewer system, for most of our older cities, especially New York, the sewer capacity is not enough to handle the increased flooding that we've been seeing, seeing in recent years. But these hubs uh, will absorb some of that water um, where those gray infrastructure is um, inadequate. So I talked a lot about what we've been doing. Uh, we're doing even more with our, our, um, our other federal agencies and with our community partners and nonprofits. So these are some additional resources. Um, you'll be able to click, click on these links when the uh, PowerPoint is shared for you to get more information. Um, and I think that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'll turn it back to Sarah. Thank you so much. That was really excellent, really wonderful examples and a great run through of how we are in FEMA. We are absolutely uh, allowed and encouraged to use uh, nature based solutions as well as encourage nature based solutions in projects. Um, so thank you so much for those uh, presentations. Uh, Jennifer and Ayla, that was wonderful. And I forgot to um, give lots of kudos to uh, the person who started us on this um, journey to uh, create this presentation, Luis Villanueva. So thank you so much, Luis. You, you did an excellent job coordinating all this with us. Um, so we've gotten questions and some folks have answered the questions, especially Ayla and um, and Francis, so, uh, but I, I'll just say them again for now. Um, we've already confirmed that everyone would like to see the template of the climate tracker. 
Uh, so, um, Ayla, if you can share that, you know, an empty version, because I know if it's in SharePoint, uh, you don't want people going in and accidentally changing something. Um, but Gary asked earlier in the presentation, uh, Ayla's presentation, do other agencies participate in the tabletop exercises to gain their agreement on priorities? Sarah, I to go um well most of mm, let me see how to make this correct the activities and the projects that are discussed with the community organizations they don't need to be linked to FEMA funds or to other federal agencies it's a general conversation and we gather information because we see it uh, like uh, it's a planning tool it's a planning conversation tool for them to start looking at their area with the with all the different components and integration of the different things uh, but we do have a mapping database and that information is uh, we classify that information by different topics from transportation water and, and different things that are available and that can be shared with other federal partners uh, in case they are reviewing a project that it's in that area. So the information is gathered and the information is, is used to, to share with them and, and also for us in our decision making process. Nice, awesome. Um, Dale asked, uh, has there been any outreach to private sector organizations to support some of those NBS solutions? Not that I recall uh, here in Puerto Rico, but I think that's a great uh, idea. I, we would, I think that's something that we can uh, explore and discuss with the private sector liaison, which is in external affairs. And um, Jennifer, same question to you. Uh, has there been outreach to private sector organizations? Uh, so for FEMA PA, um, we often look to um, our interagency uh, coordination um, branch to look at that for us. We also reach out to um, uh, our nonprofits um, to ask them to help us with those types of projects. So we have been uh, beginning that. What I think is key for public assistance is that in the beginning of a disaster before PA even starts is that communities are given all these options um, through our outreach. Um, and we have um, meetings in the beginning of a disaster with the state, with the entities that have been um, impacted by a storm, and make sure that they know that all of this information and these opportunities are available to them. So with the newer disasters, yes, we're trying to get that word out. We also work closely with EHP to help um, get the word out on that. So. Um, the key is making sure that communities think about this starting from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, before they do any hard structures and that they know that there are opportunities to um, increase their resiliency with these nature based solutions. Right, absolutely, because uh, hardened infrastructure is sort of the default. So it's important to, as Ayla was also presenting, uh, inform the communities in advance um, that this is this is something that uh, FEMA can support. Um, so uh, Dale also asks, how do we tie these solutions to economic empowerment on uh, on Puerto Rico? And it seems like there can be natural benefits uh, with improving local economies and improving nature. Well, yes, that's part. That's always part of the conversation. Uh, for example, uh, one of the benefits of uh, incorporating strategies uh, or alternatives uh, on NBS is that they improve the area and, and areas can be start used, uh, being used uh, for tourism, for, for recreation. So that's part of the, the benefits of, of that kind of activities. In terms of economic development, also a conversation piece with uh, not only NGOs, but specifically with local uh, municipalities is as I said, the integration of the plans. Uh, something that we always tell them, you can't look separately economic development plans uh, with uh, from uh, hazard risk plans or mitigation plans, because you need to consider all the elements as part to, to, 
of your development of an appropriate economic development plan. So yes, economic is part of uh, of the discussion and and also of the impacts negatively impacts of coastal erosion, for example, or flooding in urban areas. Right, absolutely, and I think that um, the nature-based solutions in general are there. There's there is an emotional element to them. They're also very beautiful in addition to being um, uh, helpful with uh, resilience and flood control or whatever it might be, all the co-benefits that you can get from nature-based solutions. They're also uh, much more um, pleasing to the eye. They attract people to want to, you might be more likely to want to walk down the the tree-lined street versus the cement uh, pavement uh, with, you know, it, it. in addition to it being shadier so that you're not overheating in the summer heat, you're also enjoying the beauty of the trees and all of the um, nature that can can be brought to that area or the the tree lined shrub lined esplanade instead of having a bulk headlined uh, waterfront having uh, sort of like park like amenities will bring more people to that area, bring more economic development to that area because more people want to live there, for example, that it could attract a lot of people that might enjoy nature um, and you know want to come down and spend money by the by the beach or by the river um, or or live in a um, live in an area that has lots of trees and shrubs and nature-based solutions. Uh, did we have other questions? I know we had one from Elizabeth who asked about PA examples, and that was a big part of what Jennifer's presentation was all about, was about um, 406 and PA examples. Um, did that all answer your question? Yes, I I was essentially getting at, are, are, is all, are all those examples collated and put together somewhere that we can access? at a later date so we're working on that um we can provide you with examples um in the background information for each of those public assistance projects um but you're right we do need to uh, bring that into one document um, and uh, make our own region two documented examples as a publication for communities i right. think that would be incredibly helpful for for other regions that are not as far along as you all are in the process, especially for things like 406 mitigation. If it's not included in Appendix J, but you've already established some sort of procedure to identify eligible activities with eligible BCAs, to be able to take mm -hmm. that information and share it with other regions, I think would be huge. Um, so just something to consider. Yeah, very good idea. We will do that. Yes, and same with BRIC, where we're developing a, um, outside of FEMA Go and um, a database and map of of the uh, BRIC projects that include uh, nature-based solutions. Yes, Regina. I think my question is more for Ayla. Um, with the nature-based solutions that you've been promoting, have you been working with any external partners for the um, care and maintenance after these uh, projects are implemented? I don't know if it's my end, but I, I wasn't able to. I have oh, trouble. Oh. Yes, Regina's mic was a little quiet, but sh um, so I, I will repeat the question. But first, if anybody has to jump off since it's 1.59, uh, it was so wonderful having you all. This was a really excellent presentation. You don't have to jump off. I will keep the presentation ru running if you're not doing anything. Um, but thank you all for being here, for those who have to jump off. And for those who don't, we will just finish out the questions, but really appreciate you all in this really excellent set of presentations. Uh, so Regina asked, who is, have you been in contact with anyone in charge of the maintenance and care of the nature-based solutions? Obviously they are alive and they have to be maintained, whether, um, whether mode or, uh, you know, like make sure the corals are, you know, like thriving, make sure the shrubs are thriving. Is anyone in charge of that? Did you hear that? I don't know if I fully understand the, the question. 
Oh, this is Regina. So I'm, I'm just curious if you're working with any other like volunteer groups or neighborhood associations or anything like that to help um, say convince a project owner to go the nature based solution direction by supporting them through either volunteer or mm -hmm. funding for the maintenance. Yeah. We do. Yeah, that's one. That's part of our, our or of our toolbox. We have a, for example, there is an academia NGO, Vida Marina. They are experts doing sand dune restoration. And one thing we did is that we used them and, and we connected them with several municipalities, Atillo, Barceloneta, Loisa, and they gave a presentation of what was uh, what sand dune restoration was about and the benefits. And as a result of that, the municipality was interested and uh, Vida Marina was able to acquire funds through a different grant uh, from NSF. And now they are doing sand dune restoration in those municipalities. So yes, we we use uh, this kind of conservation for NBS and, and for different uh, alternatives for historic properties and other things. We use the experts and we bring them to the, to the municipality. Another strategy that we use are field visits. Uh, sometimes we know that we speak about NBS and it can be something abstract for the sub applicant and they can, or, or even for us, we can say, is that even possible or, or does that even work? It, planting several bushes in, 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 a, in a water body or, or putting a rock in a river, does that really work? And for that reason, we organize field visits to already implemented and working NBS sites. That way, uh, the the proper, the, the engineer, the architect, the, the person that designed can answer specific technical questions on the project and they can see with their own eyes that the projects are working and, and most of them are even work after Maria. So yes, that's something that we do. That's fantastic. Thank you. I I know in design previously before joining FEMA, those were some of the obstacles that I was facing when encouraging layering or even going directly into nature based solutions. Those um, visualization was a part of the problem as well. You feel visits can really fix. That's great. Thank you. And everyone, don't forget to fill out the brief survey that Luis added into the chat and I will add again um, so we know how we did. Um, so we've gotten a few other questions. Uh, are you all, Jennifer and Ayla, do you all have a, a, another meeting to go to? Or we could also answer these uh, questions in the email to all attendees. Yeah, we can answer them. Um, we can, I can stand for a few more minutes. OK, um, so uh, MJ asks, is there a possibility that uh, FEMA Go or grants manager can be updated so projects with NBS elements can be flagged and searched? And I believe that FEMA Go does have an NBS flag, but it it's and, and you can also get um, this data from open FEMA uh and filter for nbs but it's not easy to look through or it's not very specific either have you found that looking through all the all the grants we give out and trying to figure out if it's an nbs or not no grants manager doesn't have that information that's why the team created the an internal tracker so right. so we can filter with that yeah, but that that's necessary. I think that will be very beneficial for the process and as an incentive to have grants manager to to add that uh, to the tabs in order to be able to filter. If I may add real quick, I think the problem now is you have to use very specific search terms and so and you might or might not get some. Uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, permanent um, pavements and things like that. And you might or might not capture uh, everything you're looking for. So for public assistance, we have a, a nationwide workshop coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'll bring that up as a grants manager improvement. Um, I know it's been talked about in the past, but it hasn't happened yet. But the more we keep asking for it, the more we'll get it done. 
awesome. That's really great. Um, I think Olivia, if you're still on, asks, how is it determined where NBS will be implemented since NBS can be applied to many different areas? So for PA, we would um, request that uh, an engineering study be done to see if it's feasible um, before we would fund it. But um, most of the time with these projects, we work uh, with the group, with the municipality who brings in the outside expertise, um, some of the um, uh, nature based organizations and um, bring in uh, the universities, especially like Rutgers University has been very helpful to community on nature based uh, solutions. So getting those um, experts to the tables with the communities um, and making sure that um, anything we fund is going to be feasible and successful. Um, so sometimes even if we want to go completely hybrid, uh, completely nature based, we have to do hybrid because of the nature of the area and the intensity of the erosion or the um, the predicted storm surge. So it takes a lot of effort, but um, something we're really working towards. And I'll ask one more question since uh, and this is a good rounding out question. Uh, do the nature based solutions projects have long term monitoring included so their effectiveness over time can be evaluated and um, improvements uh, can be identified? Um, for PA in general, um, no, but um, most of the time we leave that long term monitoring to the states um, for their uh, natural resources departments to monitor over time. And there again, um, uh, some of the uh, nature based organizations will provide that long term monitoring with their volunteer cadres and also um, a lot of times the um, universities will take that on as student research projects to make sure that their um, these projects are effective and last for a long time. Awesome. Well, that was really helpful. Thank you both so much. And I really appreciate you doing this presentation. This was really informative and excellent. And I hope that to see a lot more nature based solutions projects uh, going forward coming from FEMA funding. So thank you both so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.